this video explains the menstrual cycle for the biology syllabus. In a woman, a human woman, the menstrual cycle varies in length, but it's usually around 28 days. It can range from 21 to 35 days and even sometimes more extreme than this, but on average, we talk about it as 21 days. There's two parts to the menstrual cycle. There's the uterine cycle and the ovarian cycle. The uterine cycle is the thickening of the endometrium and the menstrua and menstruation, which is the period. We often think of the period being the entire menstrual cycle, but we see when we study it that it's in fact a lot more complicated than that. And the second part of the menstrual cycle is the ovarian cycle, which is the maturation and the release of eggs. The menstrual cycle occurs from puberty until menopause in a woman. And both the uterine and the ovarian cycle are controlled by the endocrine system. The ovarian cycle consists of the development of the graphene follicle, ovulation, and the formation of the corpus luteum. One thing to keep in mind is that people often get confused when they think that, for example, for half the menstrual cycle, the uterine cycle takes place, and the second half, the ovarian cycle takes place. That's incorrect. The uterine and the ovarian cycle, cycle both take place throughout the menstrual cycle simultaneously. They both occur at the same time. The ovarian cycle is focused on changes in the ovary and the uterine cycle is focused on changes to the uterus. So if we look in more detail at the ovarian cycle, starting with the development of the graphene follicle. The primary follicle, which is located in the ovary, and we know that the primary follicle is formed during um, while the woman is in the womb, the primary follicle matures and gets ready to release an egg. So the follicle is um, what contains the egg inside of it. Uh, we're born with this primary follicle and over the course of one ovarian cycle, it matures into a graphene follicle and where the egg, then the egg is released. So how it starts is that the pituitary gland which we learned about during the endocrine um, system, secretes follicle stimulating hormone, FSH. In the ovary, the FSH stimulates the primary follicle to begin to grow. The primary follicle develops into a graphene follicle. So the FSH triggers this primary, primary follicle to mature and become a graphene follicle. Next, what happens is ovulation. Ovulation usually happens on around day 14 of the cycle. So the graphene follicle contains inside of it one ovum. As the graphene follicle matures and enlarges, it moves towards the surface of the ovary. So if we picture it here, this would be the um, left ovary. The uterus would be located somewhere here when the ovary is joined to the uterus by a ligament. Then here would be a, um, the fallopian tube, which would go around like that and join onto the uterus. Um, so the graphene follicle moves to the surface of the ovary. The pituitary gland then secretes another hormone, luteinizing hormone, or LH. LH causes the graphene follicle to rupture and release the ovum on day 14. So we've seen here that FSH triggers the primary, primary follicle to mature and become a graphene follicle, and LH triggers this graphene follicle to rupture and release an egg. After the um, ovulation has occurred, has occurred, the graphene follicle remains in the ovary and becomes a corpus luteum. Um, obviously, the egg has now been released, so it's an empty graphene follicle, and we also call the corpus luteum a yellow body. And this is controlled by both FSH and LH. Then the corpus luteum produces um, large amounts of progesterone and estrogen. So these four hormones that I've highlighted in blue are the important hormones for the menstrual cycle. The corpus luteum usually remains until around day 28 or whenever the menstrual cycle ends, um, and then it degenerates. Then we can move on to the uterine cycle. This occurs in the uterus. These and um, the ovarian cycle, we were focusing on the ovary. The uterine cycle is a series of changes to the endometrium, which we know is the uh, vascular wall of the uterus. And the uterine cycle is regulated by the hormones, the four, four hormones we spoke about here. It can divide it into two main phases, changes to the endometrium and menstruation. So if we first look at the changes to the endometrium, we know estrogen is secreted in the ovary, from the ovary. It's secreted from the maturing follicles and it starts the repair of the endometrium. So we've seen here 
that the follicle has started to mature under the influence of FSH. Now that the follicle is maturing, it starts to release estrogen. This estrogen works in the uterus to repair the endometrium because we've just lost this endometrium during the period. Later, under the influence of both estrogen and progesterone, the endometrium thickens even more, becomes gland glandular, and it secretes mucus and nutrients, and it's also vascular, which means that it has a good supply of blood vessels. This is really important so that it can be ready for the implantation of a fertilized egg if fertilization has occurred. So from day to 14, only estrogen is secreted from, this, um, from the maturing, follic maturing follicle that's growing into a graphene follicle. Then from day 14 to 28, so after ovulation, both estrogen and progesterone are secreted by the corpus luteum. When the egg isn't fertilized, the corpus luteum will break down and the estrogen and progesterone will stop being released. Because the estrogen and progesterone have now no longer been released, there's nothing maintaining the endometrium wall and nothing causing it to keep thickening and um, growing more vascular. Since there's nothing supporting it, causing it to keep growing, it's lost and that's when we have our period. So if we just look at this diagram, we always um, talk about the menstrual cycle as starting when menstruation occurs. So day one would be the first day of menstruation. Menstruation usually uh, lasts for about five or six days. So the uterine and the uterine lining is shed, only the endometrium, not the myometrium, which are the muscular walls of the uterus. This um, vascular endometrium is released um, and shed out of the body. Then menstruation will end and the uterine lining will start to grow again under the influence of initially just estrogen. Around day 14, ovulation occurs and an egg is released into the fallopian tube. Once the egg is released, the corpus luteum remains in the ovary and starts to secrete estrogen and progesterone. Both of these hormones work together to continue to thicken the endometrium. The egg will either become fertilized and implant itself in this endometrium where it can get nutrients and blood supply, or if the egg is not fertilized, it will, um, it, the corpus luteum will degenerate and the, um, nothing will be maintaining the endometrium, so it will shed and menstruation will start all over again. So you can see it's a continuous cycle until fertilization occurs. The second step of the uterine cycle is, as I said, menstruation. The high levels of estrogen and progesterone exert a negative feedback loop, which we learned about in, during the endocrine system, on the pituitary gland and inhibit the release of FSH and LH. So because there's high estrogen and progesterone, this tells the pituitary gland to release lower levels of FSH and LH. Since there's low levels of FSH and LH, nothing is maintaining the corpus luteum because we learned earlier that the FSH and LH maintain the corpus luteum. Because there's nothing maintaining the corpus luteum, there can't be anything secreting estrogen and progesterone because the corpus luteum was the one to secrete these hormones. And because there's nothing secreting estrogen and progesterone anymore, the nothing is maintaining the endocrine lining, I mean the endometrium, and it sheds. So because, as I said, no hormone maintains the endometrium, the lining breaks down and it's shed during menstruation on day around one to five. So we know that FSH and LH make the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum makes estrogen and progesterone. Therefore, when FSH and LH aren't being released, estrogen and progesterone stop being released. So it's a negative feedback loop in terms of high estrogen and high progesterone cause low FSH and low LH. Um, this is just a diagram that you can look through to look at the menstrual cycle. Um, we know that the hormonal control of the menstrual cycle is controlled by FSH primarily from the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland. It starts a negative feedback loop which uh, lasts approximately 28 days in a human female. And the follicle stimulating hormone is secreted by the anterior lobe on day two of the cycle. So um, the period is still happening, menstruation is still happening, but a primary follicle is starting to be released again. The FSH, its main function is to stimulate the development of a primary follicle in one of the ovaries, either the left ovary or the right ovary, into a graphene follicle. Um, so we can see that the hypothalamus um, uh, stimulates the anterior pituitary gland to release FSH, if we focus purely on FSH right now. Um, in the blood, 
during the follicular phase, so before ovulation has occurred. FSH um, increases slightly to uh, promote the development of a primary follicle into a graphene follicle. It then will dip down slightly and it sometimes surges a little bit before ovulation. After that, FSH stays quite low but still present as it has to control the um, corpus luteum. But obviously because it's quite low, that's why the corpus luteum will degenerate. Um, if we look at the growth of the follicle, we can see that it grows into a graphene follicle before ovulation. Ovulation then occurs and it becomes a corpus luteum, which then degenerates. We can see that in the um, lining of the endometrium, it starts as quite high and obviously it's shared very quickly until around day four or five when it's at its lowest, it then starts to build up again under the influence of estrogen and progesterone, reaching its maximum point on day 28, around the end of the cycle, um, where it then starts to be shared again. Um, if we look at estrogen, the lining of the develop, developing follicle secretes estrogen. So we know that before ovulation, the developing follicle secretes estrogen. Estrogen inhibits FSH production so that no more um, follicles mature. So we can see here, if we look at estrogen, it peaks around there and at around that time that it peaks, FSH has decreased quite slightly. We know that FSH does increase again when LH decreases, I mean, it does increase again when LH increases to promote um, ovulation, but we mostly look at it in terms of when there's high estrogen, we see low progesterone, I mean, low FSH because there's a negative feedback loop. And we want there to be low FSH because we don't want another follicle to be stimulated. Um, estrogen also stimulates the thickening of the um, lining of the uterus to thicken with fluid and blood. This prepares the endometrium for implantation of the embryo. So some um, drawings will depict the drop of estrogen just um, after ovulation and some like this one just before. It's not that important as long as you see that estrogen does spike just before ovulation occurs. Um, the spike in estrogen is why um, luteinizing hormone LH increases because of the um, positive feedback loop in that case. And because there's a spike in LH, it causes the graphene follicle to burst and release the egg. Um, so what I said here was that there is an increase in progesterone at the end, which we'll get to later, because the corpus luteum is quite large. And we know that there's a drop in estrogen here because the graphene follicle doesn't secrete estrogen um, at all. The only thing that secretes estrogen is the developing follicle, so before it forms a graphene follicle, and the corpus luteum. When we're here at the stage of a graphene follicle, no estrogen will be released. If we then look at LH, it's also secreted from the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland, um, mostly on around day 12 to 13. It's triggered by high levels of estrogen. So in this case, it would be a positive feedback loop. LH main function is to trigger ovulation. So it triggers the graphene follicles to burst. And it also controls the development of the corpus luteum along with FSH after ovulation has occurred. The ovum only lives to 24 to 36 hours and then disintegrates. So uh, the sperm has to reach it within these um, before the 36 hours has run out. Otherwise, fertilization will not occur. If we then look at progesterone, we know it's produced by the corpus luteum within the ovary. And its main functions are to inhibit FSH production. So we know that estrogen inhibited FSH production around here. Um, progesterone and estrogen will both inhibit FSH production in the second phase of the menstrual cycle. And this, of course, is a negative feedback loop. And we can see that in that the high levels of progesterone um, have led to quite low levels of LH and FSH. Um, progesterone uh, continues to prepare the lining of the endometrium for implantation just in case the egg is fertilized. And if the egg is fertilized, um, progesterone is the one to control implantation. Uh, the corpus luteum usually lasts about, 12, about 10 to 12 days. And we know this kind of makes sense because if ovulation occurs on day 14 and the corpus luteum would last until around about day 26, um, after which low levels of estrogen and progesterone would start to occur causing there to be higher levels of FSH and LH. And because of this, the lining becomes shed around 28 days. <laughs>
If there's no fertilization, the corpus luteum degenerates and the production of progesterone ceases. Um, FSH secretion begins again once the corpus luteum is degenerated and there's less estrogen being secreted and the cycle starts all over again. Um, so if we look at some of the a, a table showing the functions of the hormones, as we said, the functions of FSH are to stimulate the follicular growth in the ovaries, so de the development um, from primary follicle to a graphene follicle, and to stimulate estrogen secretion. So when we look at it in terms of um, estrogen, if there's high estrogen, we get low FSH. That's a negative feedback loop. But if there's high FSH, this causes high estrogen. So that, in terms of looking at the FSH first and its effect on estrogen, that is a positive feedback loop. Um, if then we then look at LH, a surge in LH causes ovulation and causes the graphene follicle to rupture. And um, sorry, that's supposed to say rupture, not grow. And LH results in the formation of a corpus luteum. Estrogen, which is secreted by the ovary, well, in the ovary by the developing follicle and by the corpus luteum. Estrogen thickens the uterine lining. It inhibits FSH and LH for the large part of the cycle. Um, and it stimulates FSH and LH just before pre-ovulation, which we saw previously. Progesterone again thickens the uterine lining, the endometrium, and inhibits FSH and LH, so another uh, negative feedback loop. So the first lot of estrogen, which is secreted by the growing follicle, it does inhibit the FSH to, to um, stop it from causing another follicle to develop, but it also causes um, LH to increase. So this would be a positive feedback loop because we need this LH for ovulation. And as we saw in the diagrams, this high of estrogen could cause a slight higher level of FSH, but that's more of a side effect. Then the second lot of estrogen, which is secreted by the corpus luteum, um, as well as the progesterone, both inhibit the production of FSH and LH. That would be a negative feedback loop. Um, sorry, you can ignore that part of it. Um, we can, you can look at this, another, yet another diagram showing the levels of the hormones. We can see how the um, follicle develops, forms the corpus luteum. We can see at the body temperature, and it's interesting that just before ovulation, body temperature spikes. Uh, some people may use this, it's obviously not 100% reliable, but women often use the increase in their body temperature to see that they're ovulating if they're trying to fall pregnant. They know that this is a good time to uh, have sexual intercourse. Um, you can see the spike in the LH uh, during or just before ovulation and a side effect, a slight spike in FSH, which is caused by a spike in estrogen. We can see that progesterone and estrogen are quite high during the life of the corpus luteum. And once um, the corpus luteum degenerates uh, due to the low levels of FSH and LH, then estrogen and progesterone will also start to decrease. And again, another picture showing the thickening of the lining. This is just another small flow diagram showing negative feedback loop and how another way to um, describe it and explain it to yourself.